Welcome to Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Gavin Richard, the podcast that discusses the mysterious and strange deaths and circumstances of black celebrities. Greetings, everyone. I'm Gavin Richard. And I'm Albert Lanier. And welcome to our inaugural episode of Unsold Mysteries. That's right. We investigate the mysterious deaths and circumstances surrounding our famed melanated celebrities, civil rights icons, politicians, musicians, and many, many more. Albert Lanier Jr. is a veteran journalist who is joining me and we are going to discuss the assassination of Malcolm X. Ozzie Davis, in his eulogy for Malcolm X, called him our shining black prince. Most recently, two of Malcolm X's convicted assassins, Muhammad A. Aziz and Khalil Islam, had their convictions overturned by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. These men spent nearly two decades in prison for a crime that they had maintained they did not commit. Talmud Hager, who was one of the assassins, or Thomas Hager, I should rather say, who was one of the assassins who admitted his role in the assassination of Malcolm X, always maintained that the two gentlemen were innocent. So the question remains, ladies and gentlemen, who killed Malcolm X and why did our government cover this up? And joining me, of course, again, is Albert Lanier Jr. to discuss the findings recently in this case. Good afternoon, Al. Good afternoon, Gavin. So as you had noted, the death of Malcolm X, which occurred February 25th, 21st, 1965, is a death that is still shrouded in some degree of mystery. Now, more recent developments that have come out revolve around the uh, two men that have been exonerated, Mohammed Aziz and Khalil Islam. These two individuals were exonerated through the efforts of the Innocence Project and through the auspices of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Correct. And they were recently exonerated because of partly of efforts that came about through the Netflix documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? That of course is based on the work of Abdul Rahman Muhammad, an independent historian, journalist, and activist. And what Muhammad was able to do, was able to look at some of the very clear discrepancies in regards to the assumed killers when it comes to the Malcolm X assassination. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that documentary, which came out on Netflix February 7, 2020, mm -hmm. that was a limited series. It was done in several episodes, uh, actually received critical praise for it. Uh, things we learned about that, uh, the assassination, for instance, the fact that uh, one of the police officers did not even seize the podium or the state or parts of the stage where Malcolm X was standing behind that very podium when the shotgun blast uh, was hit from the floor below into his chest. So the article that we're reading, of course, some of you can't see it, obviously, on uh, if you're listening to our podcast. This comes from The New York Times. There is a picture here, though of the actual stage that you can see of the Ottoman ballroom riddled with bullet holes. And key evidence, of course, into why they were these men were exonerated was that the FBI, both the FBI and the New York Police Department were found to withhold evidence that could have exonerated these men. Now, it's important to note, Al, 
Mr. Islam passed away in 2009 at the age of 74. Mr. Aziz is still alive at the age of 83. These men were paroled and released back in the 80s. However, they spent 20 years in jail, which uh, sadly they will never get back. And their families, of course, suffered greatly as a result of this. But it was interesting that Cyrus Vance uh, Jr., the Manhattan DA, he apologized for the conviction of the two men saying, quote, they did not get the justice that they deserve. So while those men, of course, did not get the justice that they deserve, Malcolm X still has not gotten justice, nor has his family. That's absolutely correct. Now, what's interesting to note as a sort of precursor to what happened to Malcolm X is that before Malcolm X was shot at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem in New York City on February 21st, 1965, Malcolm X's home was firebombed. Now this occurred on February 14th, or at least it was um, prior to his assassination. Now, in an interview, um, and in a, in, when he was able to speak to the public after the firebombing, what Malcolm X was able to say, uh, and he was quoted, one can quote him at this, is that, quote, the police know the criminal operation of the black Muslim movement because they have thoroughly infiltrated it. Now, when he talks about the black Muslim movement, he probably is referring to the Nation of Islam which Malcolm X was a member of for a number of years until he opted to split, thus forming his own organization. And Malcolm X was at the Audubon Ballroom as a part of his own organization um, and speaking to audiences there. This was, of course, a part of Malcolm's sort of journey into what some would call orthodox Islam, um, for those who are unaware of Malcolm X, Malcolm X was uh, an individual who had a background. His parents, actually, his father, was involved in the Marcus Garvey movement. That would be the UNIA, United Negro Correct. Independent uh, UNIA, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Now, unfortunately, Malcolm's mother um, suffered from mental health issues, and Malcolm had to go live with other relatives. Eventually, he ended up leaving school. Uh, I believe he lived with a sister or relative in Boston at one point. And he eventually ended up in jail and in prison. And it was there in prison that he had found uh, religion, uh, more specifically the Nation of Islam. Um, and it was after leaving prison that Malcolm X became sort of a national figure because he became a speaker for the Nation of Islam and he became a major figure within the Nation of Islam, which was at the time, and I guess for some still today, a very controversial organization. Yeah, it's important to note too, uh, just to point out some uh, information about Malcolm, it was his older sister, Ella, who actually introduced him to the Nation of Islam in that movie that everyone probably have seen by now, uh, the Spike Lee movie, uh, Malcolm X, which was done in 1992. They had a fictional character named Baines who introduced Malcolm through the Nation of Islam, but he had family members, his sister, who played a role in that. And, uh, unfortunately, that was not something mentioned. Uh, another piece of biography too, uh, that you mentioned, Al, a lot of people don't know this, but Malcolm's nickname, of course, was Detroit Red. He had a friend named Chicago Red that most people are familiar with if you watch the show Sanford and Son, and that would be comedian Red Fox, who was a close friend for most of his life. Absolutely correct. It's very interesting friendship there with uh, Malcolm and uh, Red Fox. Of course, Malcolm also had other friends like Muhammad Ali at one point, uh, the world heavyweight champion yeah. boxer. For and those who, for some reason, have never heard of Muhammad Ali. Um, so 
as I had mentioned previously, the precursor to Malcolm's assassination was that his home was firebombed. And he had stated in um, this interview or the speech that he gave that had the, I think it was either the Molotov talk tales or the, the, or the uh, accelerants that were thrown into his home, had they hit in a certain place, they would have fallen on his children. And Malcolm made it clear, had that occurred, he would have taken his rifle and he would have gone out and looked for whoever was involved with that. And that, of course, led to the quote that I noted, which was that the police know the criminal operation of the Black Muslim movement because they have thoroughly infiltrated it. Now, the reason why I note this quote is because it's important to consider in regards to the assassination of Malcolm X. Sure. It's vitally important because it, it helps cast a sort of, I don't wanna say ominous cloud on the reason why Malcolm's assassination has gone truly, um, has truly not been reckoned with in regards to the law. Right. The individuals that we mentioned before, Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam were convicted but the reality was that these individuals really had nothing to do with the assassination of Malcolm they X. They were innocent. Right. 100%. Absolutely true. So that's why that quote I noted is very important because it gives an idea of what happened. Another interesting develop that's happened in recent years is a police officer by the name of Raymond Wood. Now, Raymond Wood was an officer that ended up with the New York Police Department's Special Services and Investiga Investigations Division, otherwise known as the Red Squad. Now, Raymond Wood is interesting to consider and has been considered more recently in regards to what happened with the Malcolm X assassination because he served undercover and brought in two individuals who were ostensibly involved in a plot to blow up the Statue of Liberty. Now, why is a plot to blow up the Statue of Liberty important? And what does it have anything to do with Malcolm X? Well, these two individuals that were brought in were on the security team for Malcolm X's organization. In other words, they would have been there the night of February 21st, had they not been arrested for this Statue of Liberty plot. Hmm. And this organization that we're talking about is the organization of African uh, American unity that uh, Malcolm X had founded in 1964, I believe. Uh, around now, OA. AU. Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad you mentioned that name of the that police of that police officer Raymond Wood, because uh, there's another name we're going to mention as well, who was involved, who was Malcolm's bodyguard. We found out was an informant, but I didn't want to ask you. I'm gonna let you finish. But this article, those of you who can't see, is too. His daughter, talking about Raymond Wood's daughter, uh, Kelly Wood, came out uh, saying that this letter. That her father uh, supposedly that her father wrote was fake, and I want to. I don't know if you've seen or heard about this one, Al, but uh, I do want to get your opinion on it uh, if you can a little bit. But I'll let you finish making your point on what you were saying. I don't know if you were finished or not. So when we examine the assassination of Malcolm X, which we will get to in terms of the details, it's important to consider this it's important to consider the fact of what Malcolm said before he was killed right. about police infiltration in what he called the black Muslim movement. Some would call it the nation of Islam. It's important to consider the Statue of Liberty plot, which involved Raymond Wood, who was an undercover police officer at the time. I think he was still 
pretty fresh as a police officer. He was a relatively new police officer. Um, so that's he important. Was there that day. He was there that day in the autumn of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Another police officer, I believe, that was there that was in an undercover capacity or certainly in a furtive, secretive capacity was Gene Roberts. Yes, Malcolm's bodyguard. Mm. So it's important that we look at those two aspects before we eventually consider the assassination. What Malcolm said about police infiltration and the undercover police plot with the two members of his security detail arrested for this Statue of Liberty plot, supposedly to blow up the Statue of Liberty. Keep those two in mind as a precursor to what will come up next. Okay. So we have this, when you said, you said earlier, ominous cloud that surrounds obviously that day and surrounding Malcolm X in particular, where we have these undercover police agents that are present in the Hollywood Ballroom. Uh, most people may not know this, but our late great uh, ancestor and professor, I call him Professor Dick Gregory, he, of course, knew Malcolm X personally. And something he stated based off Freedom of the Information Act, I don't want to just say it's just the NYPD, but he stated even that the CIA a week prior had rented out the Audubon Ballroom. I don't know if your research into that has found anything of that nature. But the main thing for me, too, is that based off what the uh, district attorney of Manhattan has even come out and these private attorneys like Brian Stevenson, is that the FBI's involvement in covering this up. If this were a state crime, because Malcolm X is not a politician, uh, he was not a federal official, why would the feds first and foremost care about an assassination of a private individual. That's something that the state's in the state's jurisdiction, which is, I find very interesting. It's interesting. Um, Malcolm's aide, I believe his name is Abdullah Abdur Razak, stated interview with, I believe the show was called Art Fulland Reports, that the people have this assumption that the police wanted Malcolm alive. The police wanted Malcolm dead. So again, we look at what it, are the precursors to the assassination. Mm -hmm. Police infiltration, Statue of Liberty plot. And according to Malcolm's aide, it was very clear that the police were not interested in protecting Malcolm X. In fact, when you look at protection, protection was minimal in that ballroom for what appears to be the case, which was why Malcolm was, I would say, easily assassinated. Mm -hmm. Sort of like what happened with JFK when he goes into Dealey Plaza and the no secret service agents are surrounding the presidential limo. Why, when they make that turn on Dealey Plaza. So that was interesting as well in and of itself. That also happened to Dr. King, and that's a, another story, though, we can talk about for another episode. But, yeah, the security, it, it's very interesting. All the security details in these assassinations, they, they're present for every day except for when it mattered the most, and that's when these persons were killed. I find that to be even more interesting. But uh, what everybody... If you obviously can't see this uh, this thing online, but if you are able to view this video or view this article we have here, they're talking about Malcolm's bodyguard, Gene Roberts, and this is a life fo a photograph that was featured in Life, actually uh, entitled "the the violent end of the man called Malcolm." And you see there, there is a picture. You can look this up in Google yourselves for those listening in. The violent end of the man called Malcolm. That's Gene Roberts in uh, the right-hand corner, the upper hand, right-hand corner, giving Malcolm CPR, mount to mount, while uh, he is, uh, people are surrounding him. So 
I guess we could get back to this Gene Roberts individual and this Raymond Wood. Uh, what was, uh, when they came out with this, this was, Mr. Wood came out with this, I believe, allegedly on his deathbed. Is that right, Albert? Um, yeah, I believe that he told a relative of his, um, cause he had his cousin, Reggie, who eventually wrote a book called the Ray Wood story about his relative and the details, or at least enough of the details or some aspect had come out on the deathbed of Ray Wood. Yeah. And Ray Wood, of course, as I mentioned previously, was a police officer, NYPD police officer. I believe he was promoted uh, right away after his involvement in the Statue of Liberty case and the plot to blow up the Statue of Liberty. I think he was promoted because he became part of a rather infamous unit in the NYPD, the Special Services and Investigations, Okay, nicknamed Red Squad. So what do you think of the daughter saying that the letter was fake? Uh, I didn't get an answer from you on that one. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think that's a case of just trying to save her father? Or do you think that the confession was real from your research? Or well, I think you have to give it some credibility because Ray Wood was reportedly at the Audubon Ballroom on the day of the assassination. Uh, mm -hmm. An activist by the name of Yori Kochiyama had written at one point that Ray Wood was there on February 21st, 1965, which was the day Malcolm X was assassinated. So Ray Wood was reportedly there in the ballroom, as was Gene Roberts. Um, so I think you have to give it at least some credibility. It's pretty clear that Ray Wood was aware of what was going on in regards to the assassination of Malcolm. Yes. And I don't know if anyone can see this, but this letter is dated January 25th, 2011, to whom it may concern. And Raymond Wood wrote this letter detailing his uh, role as a black New York City undercover police officer from April of 1964 through May of 1971, some of the actions that he participated in including saying that the actions in hindsight were deplorable, quote, deplorable and detrimental to the advancement of my own black people. And he allegedly wrote this, and I'm just saying alleged for legal purposes, wrote this and signed this. And of course, you can't probably see this, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening on a podcast, but if you go to the New York Post and even just Google this, uh, there's Ben Crump, who was hired by Malcolm X's family, is holding uh, the letter and was released to the public because they held a press conference on it earlier this year, wanting to reopen the assassin the investigation into Malcolm X's assassination. Now, speaking of assassination, Al, you stated that we haven't even gotten into details of the actual day of the death or what had transpired. So with the time that we have, why don't you get into that uh, right now? Well, as was previously noted, Malcolm X was assassinated on February 21st, 1965 at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem in New York City. Now, he was there to give a speech, to give a talk. And what occurred um, was that there was a commotion in the audience at one point. This was after... Malcolm had been introduced to speak. There was a commotion in the audience and an individual supposedly had said the N-word and to tell someone to take their hands out of their pocket. Uh, and Malcolm reportedly had tried to calm down the situation um, and it was 
sometime after that situation that someone emerged um, and the weapon that was used and that cited in assassination is a sawed off shotgun was someone emerged with a with a sawed off shotgun with a weapon and shot Malcolm X. Now, according to Malcolm's aide, Abdullah Abdur Razak, in his interview, in a TV interview he gave, he stated that what he saw was, because he was there that day, what Razak saw was, quote, a short, dark guy with a goatee. Let me repeat that. A short, dark guy with a goatee. Mm -hmm. He had run down with a shotgun and shot Malcolm X. Right. So that supposedly was, at least if not the shooter, then one of the shooters. Because there was clearly more than one person involved. Although there might have been one shooter or one person uh, firing the firing the shotgun or firing the weapon that was used. Yes. And this is the purported picture. He passed away in 2018. His name is Al Mustafa Shabazz. That's the name that he changed. He went by the name of William Bradley and he was featured in the Who Killed Malcolm X documentary. Uh, he was living in New York, New York, New Jersey at the time of his death. And he is purported to be uh, the assassin who fired the shotgun blast that killed Malcolm X. He has, of course, denied any involvement. Uh, Cory Booker apparently even knew him, stating that he wasn't even aware of his past identity. Uh, he was very popular in that community. So this man who uh, was already passed away, so nothing legally can happen to him. But uh, Abdur Rahman Muhammad, who produced the Malcolm X documentary, that we are talking about, he actually talked about this uh, with him in that documentary. So mm -hmm. didn't talk to Bradley, but talked about him being involved and implicated him. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned before, um, Malcolm X was shot with a sawed off shotgun. Right. And according to police at the time, there were eight to 10 shots that were fired. Um, seven of them reportedly hit Malcolm. And of those seven, one was a shot to the lower right chin and six were to the chest and the body overall of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. So Malcolm was reportedly hit with seven shots. Most of them, the vast majority, unfortunately, to his chest and the, and the rest of his body. And so this was very clearly an assassination that had to involve more than one person. And an individual by the name of Talmadge Hare had come out in the late 70s, I believe, and stated, given an affidavit saying that he was involved in the assassination of Malcolm X, along right. with at least four others. Right. And his affidavit, from what I understand, was studiously ignored or not given much credence, credibility, or attention. But it's very clear that this was more while there might have been one man who was the shooter, there were more there was more than one man involved in this assassination. And the the sad sort of harvest of death that arrived from this was that Malcolm X was assassinated and assassinated with several shots, at least seven according to the reports at the time. Although reportedly there were eight to ten sh shots fired. At him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the sad thing, too, of course, in the wake of this new information, uh, of course, with Mr. Islam passing away, 
Malcolm X's other daughter, Malika Shabazz, who was one of the twins, had died recently after the announcement of this. So uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to her and her family as well. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that it happened at the time all of this was going on. And, you know, she did not get to even see her father, or know her father, uh, you know, when he was assassinated. And this was done in front of his daughters, which was a terrible thing. His daughters and his wife present. Uh, had to witness this. But Malcolm X, of course, his legacy, despite the fact that he lived only to be 39 years old, his legacy has lived on uh, years even after his death, even to this day. And it's important that we get questions about what happened with Malcolm X because and other leaders who have been assassinated because it tells a lot about us as a nation and who we are. And we have a murder going free is especially in our society is not good so we thank you all for tuning in in this episode and hopefully we will have more in fact we will actually be doing some more and i think our next episode will be about a friend of malcolm x who died mysteriously brother sam cook so you all tune in for that latest episode of unsolved mysteries as we look at soul singer sam cook and his mysterious death at the age of 33 years old. I'm Gavin Richard, and of course, that is Albert Lanier Jr. We thank you all for tuning in to our inaugural episode of Unsolved, or Unsolved Mysteries, rather, the Unsolved <laughs> Mysteries of Famous Melanated People. Ladies and gentlemen, have a blessed day, and we'll see you all in the next one.